So, hey everyone, uh, today we have with us uh, none other than Mr. Sahil Mukhija, like he doesn't need an introduction, half of the earth already knows him, but still for the people who are in a cave and don't know him, Sahil sir, what would you like to say? Hello, my name is Sahil, I'm better known as Demon Stealer in the Indian rock and metal scene. I do vocals and play guitar in a band called Demonic Resurrection. We've been around for 22 years and I also write solo under the moniker Demon Stealer. I am though better known for my cooking channel Headbangers Kitchen and uh, yeah, that's what I do. See guys, that's as simple as it gets. Now when you go and check out the YouTube channels this man has, uh, let the chairman say something, okay? So before we go ahead, and for the audience who is watching, this is the first time I'm talking with Sahil sir. Uh, I haven't spoken to him. Just the only purpose I've spoken to him is regarding the photographs and thumbnails I've been asking for him on WhatsApp. Nothing else. Right, Sahil sir? Yeah, that's it. This is the first time we're having a chat. Exactly. So we are like talking like we are, we are friends for like 25 years, but no, that's not the case, okay? <laughs> we're just meeting right now in two minutes, okay? So without further ado, uh, let's start, Sahil sir, if you are okay with it. Uh, generally, I don't have a script for how this podcast goes. I just take a random topic and we just talk about that. So I have a really burning question from uh, a week or so. It is that how you got started in this area of creative things, of music, and then moving on to certain different tasks. Um, right. So I guess... Um... If you're talking about in general creativity and arts and things that are not book related, uh, I think ever since I was a kid, um, I've had an interest in artistic things. Uh, and I think my parents also encouraged me to do quite a few different extracurricular activities. So my mom enrolled me in speech and drama and elocution classes as a kid. So I was quite fond of acting and I used to take part in school theater and things like that. And for a while, I actually wanted to be an actor uh, <laughs> when I was in like fourth or fifth standard, a Bollywood actor. And then after that, I got into cooking, which is another creative field. I wanted to become a chef and I had taken cooking as a hobby in school. Uh, but it was only in the last year or two of school uh, when my friends kind of gave me some metal to listen to. And I really got involved in music. And in fact, before this, my mother had even suggested, why don't you learn an instrument like the guitar or something? And I was like, no, I have no interest in music. This is when I was listening to pop music like uh, Backstreet Boys and Spice Girls and all that. But once I got into heavy metal at the end of my schooling, uh, that's kind of when I really dove headfirst into uh, wanting to be a musician and pursue something creatively uh, with my life in general, like because before that I wanted to be a computer engineer, I had kind of charted out my career that, okay, I'm going to get into this college, I'm going to do computers, I'm going to go to this college and do the uh, degree, and then I'm going to go to America and do two years master's, like I was, I was all set. But uh, once I started making music, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So uh, things took quite a different turn from there on. And I guess ever since I was 16, I pretty much with a single minded focus followed and pursued the passion I had for music. Uh, to be honest, I still don't make a living out of music and I never have. Music is just a money guzzling venture or an expensive hobby, if you can call it. But everything else that I've done in life has been to sustain the ability to make music even on the side as a hobby and not, you know, have to give up on it and you know, fall into that trap of working a nine to five and all that. So that's kind of how I got started through friends, you know, introducing me to metal music. And then the music itself is what inspired and pushed me in this direction. And like that, that small uh, paragraph sounds a lot about what you've done for the entire 25 years of your life. Um, and so that's the sign audience uh, from watching this. Very good. Uh, that's the sign of that beard, you know. Everyone goes weird like that. Like he is one of the uh, greatest vocals I have heard myself and the guitars. Oh my god! Like uh, whenever you watch this man play guitars, the only thing left to do is give up. Um, that's the thing. Okay. So uh, I guess if you if you checking out these videos, do so in a very cautious way. Otherwise, don't actually check out his videos in the same room you kept your guitars because that's a danger. Um, so apart from that, uh, yes, I also gave up. So don't worry. So basically. Um, 
what uh, pushed you to the metal music in a very deep sense? Like what got you interested in related metal? Because you know we have a lot of uh, uh, genres, uh, genres in music. We have blues, we have jazz, we have pop, we have metal. So many different uh, genres in metal itself, sub genres like thrash, death, black. So what got you into that, like really deeply? I think it was everything. Uh, you know, metal is so much more than just music. But obviously, it is the music itself that first caught my attention. You know, the distorted guitars, the double bass drumming, blast beats, growling vocals, or even the even the soaring vocals like Iron Maiden, in Judas Priest. The technicality of it, the the community aspect of it. You know, uh, just it's all of it. Every part of it, the 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 way they dress, the whole atmosphere, like everything, just. I was sucked into that world of heavy metal and yeah, it just sounded good to my ears. So your, your drums didn't complain regarding anything that music. Uh, my who didn't complain? Your drums. No, no see that's, you know, that's a th- uh, very weird thing that I find people say about, you know, your drums and all because mm-hmm. metal is not a, Metal may be louder in terms of the way it's hit, but you can always listen to volume at a lower level, you know. Exactly. So you don't have to you don't have to destroy your eardrums because you listen to metal. You, know, <laughs> you could destroy your eardrums listening to Britney Spears also if you turn the volume up. You know, Britney really? Spears can be as loud if you turn it up. All these techno bands and these dubstep bands and all, like every genre, even jazz and blues, if you turn it up, it'll it'll screw up your ears. <laughs> so just listen to it at a normal volume, you know. I think it's so, it's it's the it's the harshness of the sound that you speak about, which is not palatable to a lot of people, mm-hmm. and that's okay. It's an acquired taste, you know. A lot of people don't like uh, different foods or different kinds of movies, you know. Uh, metal is just a, a different form of art. It's in the music space. It's a niche genre. Even something like jazz is actually very niche, but it's just a different sound. So, I think for me, it was just. I could not get over the heaviness of it and how it made me feel. Like when I listened to that first Iron Maiden song, Running Free, that the way my body felt, it did something to my body. Like there were goosebumps. There was just this feeling of power and energy. It's crazy. It's the music. It's it's just there's something that you can't describe. And this can be for any music. For somebody else, it might be uh, you know, an Aerosmith song or a U2 song for somebody else, it might be a Dalai Mendi, for somebody else, it might be an AR Rahman. But this is what metal did for me. It it just it hit home and it was like, you know, you found what you've been looking for. That, that's kind of the sweet spot, you know, like like uh, after searching for a prox, like like you know, we actually have to find something and we like screw our entire house for finding something, for example, uh, an, an important document, for example. And then when we find it, we're like, this is heaven, come on. Man. Okay, everything feels good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I've seen you uh, actually, you know, I, we have performed over, over a million shows, I don't know. Uh, you have toured across, uh, oh my God, that's the not, not Not that many. There, there are bands that have done more shows in one year than we've done in 22 years. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to get, you know, uh, as many shows as we would like to play, especially being uh, from India and you know the scene being the way it is here, as well as the scene out of India being very difficult to really constantly spend money and go to Europe and to have that kind of money to be able to do that. So actually, yeah, we haven't played as many shows as we would like. And like I said, there are smaller or, or like bands who have been around for half as many years of, as we have and have played like close to a thousand shows and we are barely even touching 300 I think in you know 22 years so it's not as many as people think okay um, so it's basically yeah like you say the very correct thing like, like people uh, when they see music uh, like for example people have this idea like uh, doing any creative work uh, be it music be it content creation being it uh, being an entrepreneur for example or like for example of like that like they think okay it's a flashy thing uh, to do you just get what you want you just sit down uh, just pray to lord and then he showers things he showers money from over you and you get so 
you as a, such a big content creator from the content creator perspective you are like like you know you have like maybe there's seven or eight lakh subscribers and that head bang this kitchen channel and probably if i would have a, a billion um, email accounts of myself i would have subscribed to that okay because that's a, a crazy content channel what would you say to people who think that creative things like doing creative things in general uh, is just a sweet and flashy thing and everybody can do it what message do you have for them i would like to invite anybody who says that to actually try and do it for themselves there's no other way that they will understand what goes into it um, you know till they try it themselves and honestly this is true for pretty much anything in life and because of social media today we only see the best parts of everything you know, even, like that's what shown exactly to us yeah exactly even even if you talk about your friendships your normal friends they are only posting their holidays and the best food they are eating so it looks like life is hunky dory they're not you know posting photographs of uh, the bad things that are happening in their life they're not generally sharing every little thing that goes wrong and with creators look at the end of the day like it's it is an industry that is all about visibility it's the same with actors with maybe dancers with anybody that is in the public spotlight you never get to see the the work that's gone in you know like any actor for example take a tom cruise or a brad pitt you only see them at the peak you don't unless you follow their interviews and all you don't really know their journey that it took to reach the point that they are today and this is the same for somebody who works in a restaurant as a chef or somebody who's in a company you know uh, working as a who is a ceo of a company or even a person who's in a call center you know there is a journey for everyone in their career path and it's very easy to say oh you just sit and do this uh, unless you've actually sat and done that you will never understand it you even even if you talk about a simple job as a call center you somebody might say oh what a job you have you just sit and you take phone calls till you actually sit and experience the good and the bad of that profession you will never understand it and there is no profession that is without it so every point that you have to get to takes hard work the only time you can say somebody has it easy when there is an amount of privilege involved when you are born into a super rich family where you have resources and access to things that other people don't have so you know again the challenges are different for everything and it's not to say that those people have absolutely no challenges you know i mean just imagine if you are sachin tendulkar's son or even sunil gavaskar's son and you want to play cricket i mean just look at what you have to live up to so your challenges are different from somebody who's got the challenge of basic things like buying a cricket bat or getting the opportunity to play cricket versus you know somebody who has to live in the shadow of their father who is the best player in the world whatever so everything has two sides and if anyone says that you know it's a flashy simple thing i ask you to come and try doing it if you can do it amazing like that leaves me cold that um so <laughs> um for people uh, like in that case you know uh, living your uh, for example your parents or your grandparents is a shadow of themselves even if you for example don't want to be for example a cricketer Uh, there are ten people around you saying that you have to be a cricketer because your father or maybe your someone of your family or relative is a cricketer. So in that case, he or she completely loses it, and he's like, you know, I can't give it my best. It doesn't happen because until this, and unless there's something that coming, like you know, that's coming from inside, we actually can't do it. It seems easy; it can be done. Yeah. We know how many takes we have to do for a certain video. We know we know how many times we have to like sweat to put our fans off. to sit in front of the camera like you remember right in the old days like probably yeah, when i first started making youtube videos i didn't have an ac in my room i still don't have so uh what i did was i turned off the fan i had a kind of a broken phone i set it up on the books you know books mountain of books so that it could act as a tripod and then shoot videos and if i look back on those videos those are some of the most horrendous videos i've ever made like you know you will like cry blood from your uh, eyes it's that bad but uh actually i've seen that the over the year of creating like 150 videos on youtube actually improved my speaking skills in a certain way 
where I can talk to people, even if I didn't get subscribers, I, and that's fine, you know. We just on the side by side, you're developing another skill that would actually enhance some of your uh, scalability of yourself of any profession you are in, right? So, what's your take on that? Like, how did you start creating content on YouTube as well? Like, what was your entire journey? I would really love to listen to that. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I guess my journey is very. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 definitely different. I didn't want to be a content creator. I still don't like the term content creator. Uh, I like to think of myself more as an artist. Uh, you know, especially as especially when we talk about music. Yes, I do create pieces of content from the music, but I am a musician first and foremost. And uh, with Headbangers Kitchen, I'd like to think of myself more as a glorified home chef than a content creator. But that journey, um, like everything else in my life, started because of the music. Like I said, I wanted to be a chef when I was a kid, so I always loved food. Uh, somewhere around 2007, I started blogging on Facebook uh, with a little camera phone that I had. So I was cooking my own dinner. I would take a picture, upload a recipe, and it was a fun thing to do. Uh, but then in around, like I think 2008, 2009, that's when YouTube really started to pick up in India. And so what was your age? Say, What's kind of your age in that point of time, 2008, Well, I'm 40 years old now. So yeah. that was about 20, 12, 14 years ago. So about 26 years old, I was probably. So I, I, was, yeah, I was pretty late to the content creation game, <laughs> so to speak. But again, like I said, my motivation was, uh, was a little different. Like I was doing these blogs on Facebook and I liked the way it was going. 2008 or so, uh, YouTube had suddenly started to become popular in India. Broadband connections were getting more common. Um, and I was watching a lot of cooking videos on YouTube. Uh, there was this channel called Epic Meal Time. These guys would take, like, just to make the most ridiculous food in the world, you know, like uh, put 10 pizzas on top of each other, put a burger inside, a, make a burger out of pizzas, put a, a take yeah. a pig and and stuff the pig with a turkey with the turkey is stuffed with a duck and the duck is stuffed with the pigeon and they wrap the whole thing in bacon and they cook it like it was insane <laughs> and there was another channel that did like all this barbecue food like you know whole pig roast and uh, all this like American food typical barbecue stuff so I was watching all this and I was getting really like inspired by it to cook more and to make these you know foods because I love to eat so obviously I was cooking um and DR just shot our first music video at the end of 2009. And that time I spoke to the director, Srinivas Sundarajan, who uh, is now quite a famous indie director. He did uh, a season of The Duerist. He had some indie films out and he's just generally like a really talented guy. So I asked him, I said, look, I have an idea of taking my this Facebook cooking blog and making video versions of the recipes, you know. Because like I can upload it on YouTube. And he's like, that's a good idea. But what if we did something a little more? So I was like, okay. So we sat and we brainstormed. And that's how we came up with the idea for Headbangers Kitchen. Uh, you know, a shoot. I'll make a dish inspired by a band. And I will interview that band on the show. And then they will eat the food. That was the original oh. format of uh, <coughs> Headbangers Kitchen. And obviously the good part about it is that people will hopefully watch it because it's such a unique concept and because people are watching it metalheads are going to see me and they're going to be like oh this guy oh he has a band oh let's check out his band so at the end of the day i did everything in my life to make sure demonic resurrection got some benefit at the end of it whatever it, is, survived, it, somehow. it the at the end of the day the goal was always demonic resurrection is what i want to have as my number one thing in, in my life that makes my money, that does everything, it becomes my job. Of course, that's never going to happen. You know, life has different, uh, you know, things it throws at you. But everything I did was in an effort to promote the band, which is why even the initial episodes, you'll see the cooking section is called Demonic Cookery. Mm -hmm. Because everything I, I used to label demonic. So my studio was Demonic Studios, you know. So, like, I did that branding so that it all comes back to DR at the end of the day. But anyway, so when we started the show, actually, Vas got a whole team. So there was two camera people. We had lights. They would edit it. 
and we did one episode a month and we did this for about eight episodes or seven episodes and vas and his team tried to pitch this show to like a travel and living channel and like different people unfortunately nobody picked up on it for various reasons because you know at that time the scene even the food scene was very different in india so long story short they were like look we did this for 6 7 8 months now it's a lot of time and resources for us and we can't keep doing this for free and since you obviously don't have any money which i didn't and i wasn't making any money of youtube they said like tata bye bye and i was like cool fair enough you know you guys did whatever eight episodes that was a lot so then after that i tried to keep the show running by hiring people of my own like to film and edit and then i bought lights and invested in that setup and at this point we were still doing it in like my living room so we would i bought a separate gas stove and a why like a gas cable and i would take the cylinder to the living room we'd set up my dining table put up the lights so it was a huge production and i did this for i think till 2014 or so so 2011 was the first episode uh, 12 13 yeah four years i did it and after that it was like man there's no money coming from this and at that point i think even the views and all were not like super high or anything um, so what was the it, entire it, view and subscriber count in that point of time like after working eight nine months this is a working 2011 12 13 14 four years we were at some 4000 or 5000 subscribers i think or 4000 actually and each video would get 2000 views maybe like so i was like man it's too much effort i can put all this effort into making more music so i that's when i kind of said i'm done with the show as it was you know the format of interviewing bands and all and then i just started doing videos by myself with one camera in my kitchen when i had time and in the beginning i did also interview a few local people again it was when when they could come to my house when they were okay to stand in the kitchen and chat like that whole two camera setup and all that stuff i like is it done with this and then around 2016 i started doing the keto diet and <laughs> i was like oh man i'm making a pizza out of cauliflower so that's insane let's film it and yeah the next thing you know suddenly the channel is like in i think 2 3 months it's picked up and it's gone from 5000 to like 10000 subscribers like it's literally doubled in Three months with the keto stuff, and I kept getting comments: "Do more keto, do more keto." And I think uh, at this point, I had also signed on to one of those MCNs or MNCs, whatever they are called. Mm. They like keep uh, telling you, you know, like they 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 check the channel hygiene and they'll. I love that. Ah, yes, exactly. <laughs> so these guys were always like, "Hey man, do a recipe for this festival. Why don't you make a video?" I'm like, "Listen, I don't want to be a I don't want to be a YouTuber." stop calling me and harassing me for all this <laughs> so like it was it was just like this very random thing i had signed up with them just because i don't even remember why but anyway i think april 2017 i or 16 i think 16 i said okay guys i'm cancelling the contract since my channel is growing and i'm going to handle it myself i got a payout of 100 dollars or 120 dollars from which after their cut and all i got 95 dollars in my account This is for 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15. Five years of YouTube, I got ninety-five dollars. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Indian pass on it. The next month, the next month, May of 2016, I made a hundred dollars in one month. And you were like cloud nine. I couldn't believe it. I was getting views, subscribers, comments, and money. and every month it just went up and up and up and finally that became my job i quit my day job with fatados music after 11 years and i became a full time youtuber damn oh my god <laughs> so it just started out as like you know this yeah doing it taking it seriously uh nothing going on again leave left it and again jumped back into it and then it worked yeah and i jumped back with the with the intent of like just make what you want when you want there's no dedic- like there's no timeline there's no goal there's no end goal it's like when you're bored of making music when you're like uh, fried with like all your other stuff 
and you want to cook a recipe and you it's something interesting you film it yourself in one camera you do the edit on a cheap software on your computer and it's done and it worked and i'll and the thing is it's it's right time and right place yeah it's from in my case i truly believe it was just pure luck and i still tell today don't really want to be a content creator so to speak like tomorrow we are like sahil you can make music with dr as your full time thing or your demon stealer project and but you will have to get rid of your headbangers kitchen you will make no money you will get no views i will say okay fine because for me music is always the first love you know but i i can't complain because like i would rather be doing youtube as a job than actually working in a company or something else ah, exactly so, so this so is the better thing. thing this is the best job to have yeah exactly Wow, I mean, you know, like like hearing these kind of like inspiring stories because, uh, as you say, you don't like this word content creator, but uh, if you look around, like you also know this very quickly, that everything we consume nowadays is just a piece of content, whether it's videos, whether it's music we listen on Spotify, that has become kind of a, you know, music has become kind of a software itself. You know, uh, we listen to a lot of podcasts like what I'm doing. So basically, uh, when I started my channel, like I have a really small subscriber, like probably I have three hundred subscribers. You know, um, I saw I went to your channel. See guys, see, 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 see this man sitting <laughs> over here. See this man. He's visiting my channel. Come on. Um, so i closed and opened my youtube channel six times before actually starting this one six times so once i had 24 subscribers i had 80 videos put on and we have 37 views and you like i don't have to say like you know how much hard work it goes into shooting a video while putting yeah. the fans off and you're sweating like a pig exactly so uh, i then closed it out and i was like okay this is not working out Uh, and because I had a really terrible phone at that point in time, it had uh, a five megapixel front camera, which is hazy in the front due to dust. And, you know, it's just like cloudy. It's just a metal video, a metal music video, honestly. Um, then I closed it. Then I again opened the channel uh, with a name of probably like uh, lesson code. I thought, okay, let's make this a guitar lesson channel because I play the guitar. I know the guitar. Let's speak about that. Uh, well, I put out fifty videos. Some videos got over hundred views, and whenever videos used to get a hundred views, I was like, "Yes, yes, yes, this happened, this happened." And then again, and then again, I'm like, "Okay, thirty eight views and one like and one hate comment." Like, for example, "Good suck." I'm like, "Oh, okay, this is not working." So basically, at the very first time, I used to really mind a lot. You know, these these hate comments, like, "Why are people saying bad things? Why are people hating?" And basically, you also when you started creating these pieces of content out of music and food. You also got a lot of hate. Like, there's no doubt regarding that. How did you cope up with that? Can you just tell me personally, please? Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, again, you have to realize that I have come into YouTube or wherever it is after being a musician for ten years already, and the the critique and the 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 comments that I got in the initial years of Demonic Resurrection. was far worse than anything i've ever got on my youtube channel you know in fact i would say my youtube channel has got way more positive comments than negative ones you know i mean sure there are negative comments but none of it has been the kind that actually makes me go wow why the hell is this person saying this because i think by now i like by that time i had realized that okay you know i know who i am i know what i want to do i myself already know the technical aspects of what can be improved what is better most people who are blindly hating have are they blind haters i mean there's no they're they're lacking something in their life that they're projecting on you you know and then there are obviously people who dislike it simply because it is there is a personal preference you know like somebody doesn't like death metal i mean if they're watching a death metal video it's okay they don't get it you know they're like why are you growling these cookie monster vocals suck now i understand that that person does not like this style of vocal so his comment does not bother me because he's like okay he doesn't like these vocals that's cool it's and it's kind of good person, he's like he's like telling that okay, i don't like it because i have another preference but there yeah, are just people hmm, exactly 
yeah and and you have to realize like i came from a scene that was far more competitive and cutthroat and i myself was quite a as to a lot of people back in the day i would tell bands you suck this that like i was an angry teenager you know and again as you grow up you sort of learn more things and you can then impart that learning to other people whereas when we were coming up there was no one to really tell us these things you know like like there, there were handful of people we looked up to and those were also mostly old and bitter people that you know <laughs> had not I know, I had know. not made it had not made it or had not had the success they want and i i feel like in general people love to blame other things for you know things the that blame game, yeah. rather than saying you know what maybe it's just it is what it is you know maybe we are just average mediocre at what we do and that's okay you know not everyone is born with a natural talent and you know you you as much as you put in you get that much back you know absolutely absolutely so yeah i mean i i don't really let you know um, hate bother me at all like i i get more annoyed by things more than like like i don't like i get annoyed because the same stuff gets posted so many times like especially on headbangers kitchen because my audience is a lot of uh, middle aged women okay so <laughs> and oh yeah i mean that that's the biggest demographic so there are a lot of these christian ladies in america who just lose their mind when they see me go horns up and welcome <laughs> headbangers kitchen and they're like oh you need jesus and you know oh, oh you you're worshiping the devil and it, that, like that's more irritating than anything else you know like i don't look at that as hate i'm just like oh my god another one of these people you know oh my god <laughs> you know and then um, like, yeah you know th- there are always the racist people also you know will will make some shitty racist comment but then you just delete and block yeah simple like like spam comments you know you just you know and- yeah like 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 i can understand someone's opinion and if it's not necessarily a favorable favorable one also you leave it there like there are a lot of these on uh, and i'll tell you one thing there's definitely more judgment and um stuff on music stuff in the metal yeah. space than there is in the cooking stuff like in the cooking stuff i'm telling you you will you will you get very few of those so when you came into youtube and stuff you were already experienced and had kind of developed a shield against all of that uh, with your 10 years of doing music yeah so that was kind of an engineer qualification you had when you came into youtube yeah and and the thing with the music thing is wasn't just online like you know it's one thing when people tell you stuff online but when you're standing on stage and the whole crowd of 5000 people is booing you and throwing bottles oh. at you that happened. that when yeah of course we got one show where there were stones thrown at us and we were actually dodging stones on stage and, Holy and uh, fuck. Of, yeah this was at <laughs> independence rock one of the editions bombay crowd is like used to be really rowdy like if you didn't play the favorite cover songs or if you weren't really really good they would let you have it like there are bands like brahma and all who have had fish thrown at them uh, people have peed in bottles and thrown at them luckily for us the worst was stones uh, small pebbles one of them actually so we have a key, we had a keyboardist mephisto now so, everybody yeah. else in the band the drummer is too far behind the drummer is very far so nobody can reach the drummer so he is secure behind the drums <laughs> he is secure behind the drums me and both the other like the bass player and the guitar player are we can move on stage and dodge things but poor mephisto's keyboard can't go anywhere so he's standing behind and trying to dodge he actually got hit on his head with one of the stones and i think we were covering a demo borgir song and the ending there's this one keyboard part just before that part somebody threw a stone and it landed in between the two keys and got jammed so he couldn't play the part properly also it was is pretty bad <laughs> is there a video of that on youtube no this was like 2004 or 5 something like when when there was no cell phone cameras like everyone was not busy filming i guess that's also probably why people used to throw <laughs> stones and all now you know if they don't like it they just go on their phone and they're like okay scrolling through instagram or whatever it was like shit i don't like this i've had my beer already or i've had my drink or whatever i'm drunk in the crowd now pick up stone throw it got nothing else to do literally Oh my god so what what happened after you got injured like do you remember what happened after that 
no i mean he must have gone backstage and put a bandaid or something because it was not a big stone but it was definitely gave him a little bump on his head so 5000 yeah a stone shower literally no no it wasn't thankfully not all 5000 through stones just a couple of people in the crowd <laughs> so yeah damn oh my god <laughs> like this is you know this is this is the stuff we face as you know creative people as musicians like you know uh this is one of the worst shows you had uh can you remember another worst show you had ever especially in india because i can understand doing a metal music uh, while staying in india is uh, is hard <laughs> yeah i mean uh, the other worst show i would say is uh, probably the rolling stone metal awards in 2010 maybe i think so we had just gone to the uk me and the bass player hussein we actually won an award given by metal hammer magazine wow so we were we were hanging out with the metal gods in the in the uk uh you know like people from machine head black sabbath uh, immortal you know emperor like these people demo borge they were all backstage we were hanging out there we won an award for global metal so like this is a prestigious award ceremony in the uk we've literally like it's the first time an indian band has even gone and been like nominated and won and we were like on a high and at the same time rolling stone metal awards was happening and uh, now we had a little rivalry again it was not us but it was the fans of this band called infernal wrath in bombay so like i was saying we had just gone to the uk we won the metal hammer golden god award and uh, the rolling stone metal awards were kind of happening in india and we were going to be playing now we sort of had like this rivalry with a local band called infernal wrath and again it wasn't the band members of that band but their fans hated us because their drummer was our ex drummer and their guitarist was our ex guitarist as well so for whatever reason they just they just did not like demonic resurrection so we were on this high we came back from uh the uk like f- we won a metal hammer golden god like we're now playing the rolling stone metal awards and there was a public voting at that time and we were winning in all categories except for one category where these guys were also nominated so we came down and at that gig that we were playing these guys were heckling us throughout our set uh they were like you know middle finger and just they like our fans wanted to mosh and all and these guys would go and like you know stop them and they basically just made it like really really horrible to just be on that stage you know and it was just like a really really terrible feeling especially like after you've gone and you've won an international award and and this is a night where we were winning local awards as well but like the whole experience was like tarnished by these few guys uh, yeah by these guys in the crowd behaving like you know like spoiled little kids there yeah. you know and i'm not a confrontational person and these are also quite big guys like huge <laughs> so which is why they create trouble and yeah i mean i'm anyway not a confrontational guy so it's not like i'm going to go and like start a fight or whatever but it's just it was not cool man like we really that was a really bad show for us like we played fine and all but obviously you know you feed off the energy of the crowd and the vibe in the audience and when that entire thing is like messed up just yeah it's kind of like devastated from inside like you know we are creating music but at the very end what we're getting is this shit because of some we're getting we're getting local gundagiri basically like like our indian politicians do gundagiri and you know beat up people randomly is the same same thing they would do so it's kind of relatable you know everywhere you go in the world you can actually relate india it's it's kind of a, yeah yeah of course uh, no no this was in bombay thing. this was in bombay not not anywhere oh. this was bombay yeah. when we had come back home and bombay is like our home hometown okay. again which yeah. is why I, you know we i don't have a very happy <laughs> relationship with playing in bombay because of first the independence rock gigs where you know stones bottles and all got thrown and then all these kind of and it's never been like the bands themselves it's always been fans you know so first it was these infernal rock fans who would do this then after that it was like the fans of these other local bands zignima and providence who also did shit like this at one of our i rock gigs again so like bombay has always been like a very hostile place for us rather than it actually being one of the places we should have the most fun playing at you know so 
on the road like you face a lot of trouble like of course like being musicians is like you know not really yeah. uh, shiny and glowy and um uh basically how like this is a very important question for me as well because i am just i'm just starting out as a musician like i'm playing and doing content for a like you hate that word but still i'm applying that uh, content for over 3 to 4 years i'm doing it um how do you develop yourself as uh, like right now if i can sum it up you kind of an entrepreneur and a musician as well right so yeah. <laughs> so how do you develop yourself musically and uh how do you develop your mind in the business side of things as well um so to be honest i don't really think i've developed myself musically as much as i would have liked to um i think it's just it's trial and error for me man like reading like when it comes to the business music business side of things there's there is nothing there is no youtube no books available no no music business courses nobody else doing music business here uh so we literally had to like sort of write the book for the indian music scene while we went along like not obviously not just me there were many other people there was you know like a vijay nair who was managing pentagram and then there were a whole bunch of other people who later started formed companies and created festivals and i mean like at that point like it was like there were like two music festivals one magazine you know rock street journal so there were very few people to really learn the ropes from and we did what we could but i would constantly read like articles online when i could find them a lot of it was trial and error you know learned from my drum teacher so my drum teacher helped me organize the first gig that we ever played so kind of with him i learned okay this is how i go to a venue this is how i talk to them this is what i get from them this is what i have to pay for this is the amount of money i need like just all those things it it was just like you learn as you go same thing with recording you know friend came over and taught me some basic stuff which he discovered on his own and then i had to just trial errors which is why our first record sounds so bad it sounds terrible you know i didn't know anything about you know double tracking guitar so the whole album is mono oh, except oh, the right. drum yeah except the drums i think because uh, of of fruity loops but like you the keys and all, I mean, yeah I, i didn't have a pro sound card so i had like one ep to ep cable that i would use from the headphone out of the the cog ax1g and that plugged into my computer sound card and i used some software called entrax studio so like literally like i exactly entrax studio i remember this one uh, this is a phone version which also comes with this kind of a thing you know you just tap with the beats you have a small yes. graph that's going to be yes the entrax studio is there and the phone as well this you is for people like, like, like me right <laughs> you know, so like like so we had no like today if you are starting to record like you can have an amazing sounding first song like first of all you just go to youtube you have first of all tons of amazing free software then you've got tutorials for all these softwares today when you just plug your guitar you have interfaces available so cheap you know Daddy. like you just buy it usb connected done you're good to go your software your guitar software the tone you get right from the first chug is amazing like you could do nothing to the drums guitar bass that you record and it will still sound so good like just the starting baseline of what you have is so good now like back then none of this existed like the the guitar sim sims were so awful the processors were terrible there was no ax effects nobody had tube amps here you know so like that that baseline of just having good production has changed over like the last two decades like by leaps and bounds so yeah i mean we basically just like whatever we did we learned as we went along and you can see that in our the way our album sound like if you hear the first dr album the second the third the fourth you will actually hear the production getting better because i'm learning more i'm getting more gear i'm like i'm just improving and i guess for me i mean obviously i i think i didn't practice enough so musically like my actual skill level on the guitar is very average like i can't play solos i i can write riffs that's about it you know and the riffs you write uh, will take 10 years for us to actually uh, uh, proper so so yeah that's i, I think you, i think you, i think you're being too generous like honestly like 
the learning the riffs is the easiest part of it you know i like see I, and that's the thing for me i don't think of it as like the riff has to be difficult to be good so you know in that sense for me it's about the song you can write a great song with even just four chords as we know you know so as much as i would love to play technical i know i don't have it in me to sit and practice and put in those hours to become that good because i'm happier to sit and write a song in that same amount of time you know because from for me the song doesn't have to be complicated or like the most insane riff for it to be good sometimes the best songs are the simple ones you know it kind of just conveys a message through the song yeah because that's for me music is 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 always looked at like that it's like my emotions my thoughts my my expression that that's that's deep talk that this is kind of a spiritual podcast going on right here <laughs> uh uh-huh. so uh like how did you got yourself into guitar like what interested you in this six string beast uh, the the music bro like like i told you metal just took over me the music the way it made me feel and i feel like metal is one of those genres like whoever listens to it they want to form a band <laughs> it's just there it's like you see that those concerts of slayer and metallica and the yeah. massive now you like i want that like i want to be on stage i want to play this music and i want to see like thousands of people head banging to it you know and that that is literally what kind of pushed me to want to write my own music and so we were a group of us in school who all went to metal together so it was like the moment we finish our 10th standard board exams everybody will learn some instrument and will form a band of course everyone started learning but how many still play and how many actually <laughs> continued and how many actually formed a band it was a very different story but it was a thing we like let's all do this and that's kind of where i started uh so th- this is a question like do you remember the hours of time uh, you practiced your instrument or is this a good word to use i don't i don't use this word practice i like really hate this word i don't know why you know like like if, if you are told to sit and practice uh, a thing which is generally for the uh probably the full of the earth this planet is considered as a hobby or a passion if you have to practice your passion then i think for personally myself is better not to do that so what do you think uh, of this word practicing an instrument i think i disagree with you a little bit here because i think practice is re- required for anything mm-hmm. and even a hobby even even cooking i have to practice i have to uh, cook dishes i have to try different things i have to make mistakes i have to burn a dish on the frying pan i have to you know you have to do all that like unfortunately it's not like you can be like hey this is a thing i'm interested in suddenly i can play no like yeah, you pick exactly. up the guitar the the idea is to find a teacher or a method of learning or a practice routine that you actually enjoy exactly now ob- but obviously there is going to be some stuff that is really boring like if i want to learn how to be a great chef there i mean yes i don't have to go to a restaurant and you know learn and sit and like peel potatoes for you know 6 months till i get to cook a dish i can uh, i can just start cooking at home but i will still have to chop onions peel potatoes i will have to do it over and over again and try and get my skills correctly it's the same with guitar you want to sit and you want to get your fingers to move in a certain way you want to be aware of what you're doing so that you don't you know see again like there are people who have weird technique who just play but if you can improve your efficiency if you can improve the ability to take what's in your head and translate it on the instrument why would you not spend that time it's like a language uh, this is the best what daniel my ex bandmate and guitar teacher also at some point oh my god like, look you look at music as a language now when we talk to each other now i'm not thinking about my grammar i'm not thinking about what tense i'm using like it's i learned all of that in school and it's so that's kind of the music theory stuff yeah theory practice and and i've spoken enough times that now i can articulate myself in a appropriate manner and sometimes i don't always do that but that's also okay you know because i'm not a robot is going to give you perfection every time but the more you do something you know the the better you get at it and again there are you know like like you said maybe of board practicing so you can just play songs and learn covers and you you will eventually get 
somewhere with that. But if you maybe sat and practiced instead, if you actually took a few lessons, you would reach that destination faster. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. So the it's it's a trade off. You know, and again, I I'm a I think I'm a good example of that. I hated practicing. I I I didn't even like learning cover songs. Like I would learn three riffs, I would get to the fourth riff. Fourth riff is too difficult. Forget it. Let's write a new song of my own. You know, and but that's just me, and that's what I wanted from the instrument. You know, and and on the other side, you take someone like Nishit, who was in Demonic Resurrection, or even our new guitarist Aditya. I mean, yeah, they yeah. have obviously put in hours and hours of just ta 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 ta. ta. Now they can go. <laughs> and if I want to do that, I have to be like, "Hello, Aditya Nishit, can you come and play?" Because yeah. I can't do it, you know. And that's the trade-off, you know. What is your ultimate goal with the instrument? Actually, I think that determines you will practice. For someone, it's like I want to be able to play like you know Joe Satriani, Steve Vai. I want to be able to play amazing leads. I want to be the best guitarist. That's great. I never wanted to be the best guitarist. I wanted to play guitar so that I could write songs. That was my goal. Uh, you know, I wanted to write the riffs that made a kid somewhere go. If he can do it, I can do it too. You know. Okay. Like I want, I want my to to write stuff that had an impact on people. you know that's what doing music ultimately means like you know you have to convey something to the listener i i again i here i'll disagree with you because everyone does music for different things you know mm-hmm. like there are a lot of musicians who never write a song in their entire life who play backing band sessions band i mean there are people whose music outlets are writing jingles film scores composing bollywood or writing you know so music is so vast i mean all think of all the people who play in orchestras yeah they're exactly. not necessarily sitting down and writing a song mm-hmm. but it's you know all the guys who play in wedding bands guys who play at your ganpati and durga pujas and all that so that's all music right so music is so vast that it's everyone's journey everyone's desire everyone's relationship with it is different you know some of us are songwriters some of us are not and that's okay you know exactly. some people just want to like some people just want to play the instrument they don't care where how and what i want to be playing guitar and that's my job like i want to be paid to play guitar that and then they learn the instrument with that intent you know or as they are learning they say like wow i really love this and this is what i want to do and then they like they know that okay to achieve this goal this is what i have to do i have to practice this i have to have my versatility i have to be able to listen to something and play it back for somebody else i have to read sheet music for me it was i want to be able to write a demonic resurrection song can i do that with my skills yes i'm done wow like you know that's a really great word you applied there it's called intent like it's like how you approach a particular passion which you are pursuing that's where you're going to go that's how like that's how you going to go through that for example for people it's like uh, you know i can give hours sitting on the bench now and uh, working on my fingers for other people they are like okay i just want to jam out four uh, major chords and just write an indie song and who knows maybe that indie song will be on the chart chart one of the billboard the next day no one yes, knows you know? absolutely yeah so uh, it's like kind of a different thing and it's kind of beautiful to watch also because Let's consider this. Everyone became serious as a musician. Everyone practiced sixteen hours a day. Then the fun would actually go. It's like you know, you can work harder. And yeah, it's like I I also think they should like. I'm sorry to segue into this, but like I think there's this really wrong notion that you have to practice eight ten hours a day or like mm. some ridiculous amount of exactly. hours to become good. The thing is. Uh, and again i get a lot of this from musicians i have worked with and learned and taken ideas from is like 20 minutes of focused concentrated practice is better than 1 hour of just sitting with the metronome and you day dreaming because you're not paying attention to what you're actually doing then because if you sit with the metronome and you just do 1 2 3 4 and you keep doing this and your mind is wandering you're not you're not focusing on your motion you're not focusing on the sound of each note instead if you had 20 minutes where you focused on your clarity 
on how your finger lands on the string, on how coordinated your right and left hand is. Your 20 minutes will do what you would otherwise take eight hours of practicing to do. You know, so I think exactly. that is more important. So that you can you can make progress even with smaller practice slots. You know, exactly like you know. Uh, this is this reminded me reminded me of something. It's like the quality of the practice that you do, not the quantity. Yes, quality exactly. over quantity, always. Exactly. You know, that's where our minds kind of get goes. You know. Yes. Um, so it's kind of like you know, in school days we used to do this. Our mom used to you know remember used to say to us study for three hours. Uh, we would open the book for two point five hours, but last fifteen or thirty minutes we'll actually study, and then yeah. we wonder I studied three hours, but why did I fail? I think because you failed because you just wasted two point five hours wondering about what sandwich you will have on your friend's birthday, for yeah. example. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, so uh, that's a very good thing. I like you know I realized this after practicing you know like a lot for. Two and a half years. Then I realized, okay, no, it's kind of the quality of the practice. It's not quantity. Yes. If I, if I play for yeah. sixteen hours, probably my technique would be ruined. It's like very bad. So I have my yeah, body will also give up. Exactly. Body exactly. Will give up. Like becomes too oversaturated to do something. You know, it's just like look, this is not happening. Like the more you push, the more like destroy. Like, the more destruction is happening. Yeah. So uh, basically. How did a uh, demonic resurrection form? Like what? How did this first and foremost? I would like to say this thing. Like uh, <laughs> every one of your uh, ventures have this word demon in it. What attracted you to this word? I I think more than the word, it's the imagery. I love like demons and monsters and you know, uh, fantasy based things. You know, dragons and uh, orcs and all that. Like you know. Like that, just that whole imagery was something I thought was really cool. Like you know, uh, I guess I got it from video games like Diablo and stuff like that. You know, Doom and all that. So like the whole that whole imagery is something I really liked, and it like especially it's prevalent in like black metal, uh, which I was very into. And metal in general has a lot of that imagery. And like I said, the music. It's all aspects of the music that sort of consume you: the artwork, the lyrics, you know, the stories, and uh, yeah, that was just it. So I mean, I was like, yeah, okay, let's, you know, I want a band name, and I kind of have this. It, it's, it has to be dark and like demonic, and that's, that's kind of just, where it. Uh, yeah, it just it's it, it the music and the name have to match each other. That was the idea. So uh, you also like like do a. Uh, Just a fucking like huge amount of vocals over there. How did you how do you develop your vocals? Um, once again, trial and error. You know, uh, I sang, and next day my throat was sore, and I couldn't talk. And then I did it again the day after, and again I so so every alternate day I would practice. I would sing along with my favorite songs. Started doing gigs. At some point, tried different techniques. to make the sound i wanted to you know uh, to achieve that tonality kept recording myself and just the really trial and error like i still don't know till today what i'm doing when i sing you know um, i read a lot of singing lessons so i i practiced some of those singing basics that i could find online uh, but largely man just trial and error and like like with with my guitar i don't know much of what i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> with my vocals either you know i'm not tuned into the theory part of it well enough like i don't know which thing i'm doing i don't practice regularly as well with my vocals you know uh, i just manage to do what i need to do for now wow no having this kind of a approach is what we don't get to see every day with people especially musicians because uh, the music industry is uh, One of the most cutthroat competitive industries, like any other. Right. Yeah, like, I think a lot more. Has, hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with also again, like like I said, I am a unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way, I am a hobbyist musically. So, I told you, like I said, we played maybe in twenty two years three hundred shows. That's hardly any. So I haven't had to do extensive vocal. practice or training to sort of 
have like this rigorous like it's very different like tomorrow if i have to play 100 shows or 200 shows in a year my vocal journey and my guitar playing and all will be going in a totally different way because the application is different now i'm at I, I, i think at drs peak in india we were doing maybe two shows a month and this lasted for one year maybe so maybe there was one year where we played 24 shows or i don't even think i think it was six months that we did two two shows and then there was like six months dry so the maximum i think we have ever done in a row has been like some 10 11 shows in one of our uk tours so we never had the stress of touring so i have never had to like adjust like even today if i'm recording i can record half a song today if i feel tired i'll record the other half tomorrow or in you know so i have never had that pressure of like okay i got to go to a studio i have one or two track vocals or i have to go on tour and i have to do 50 shows in a row so my approach to the instrument vocals everything is just it's chill it's a hobby that's probably why i have not gotten sick of it that's why i still have a passion for it uh you know at least the recording and creation side of things you know so i think that also makes a big difference you know if if you are someone who's like you don't have the ability to record at home and you're like okay we're going to a studio we have to put in 1000 rupees an hour that's coming from my pocket i'm 20 years old and i have like no money then you know you've got a goal so you you then work with that in mind you know exactly 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 uh uh do you remember the first gig you entirely as the demonic resurrection sorry demonic resurrection as the band the god itself what was the first gig and like as an entire band what was all of your reaction um so the first gig we ever played was april 6 2000 at a club called raspberry rhinoceros in bombay uh, my guitar my drum teacher ovi was ovin was had uh, helped me organize the show so his band naked earth was headlining before his band was a band called scepter i would later go on to learn guitars from the vocalist of vocalist and guitarist of scepter timir and meta kicks this other band opened the gig and then second was demonic resurrection i remember it very clearly i was on stage in my rotting christ t-shirt <laughs> this this show we did not have a bass player it was aditya mehta on guitars prashant shah on guitars yash mehta yash patak on drums and me on vocals that point i was not singing and playing because i couldn't do it i tried to play bass and sing before the show i couldn't do it so i said i'll just sing we went on stage the entire crowd sat down because this is our first show nobody had ever heard us they sat down we started the show i was i normally wear glasses so i had taken off my glasses i could see just blurry faces everything was a blur i stood at the mic i did not move we did four songs i think we did three originals and then we did one medley of one slayer song and one sepultura song so we did slayer seasons in the abyss basically the solo was too difficult of that song so when the solo comes in we go into slave new world and we play the full of slave new world so that solo was just wa so the guitar player could ham it prashant and i remember everyone was sitting down for the entire set before the slayer song i said are you ready for slayer my one friend from school got up put his hands up hands up in the air came head banging next to the stage turned around saw that nobody else had got up and he went and sat again that was that was really awkward <laughs> that was so funny but whatever we played okay there were no no huge mistakes nothing and we went on stage people said good show this that we were happy it was a good first show i mean could have been better sure you know but again it was a first gig we learning and yeah that was it so no stone shower in the first show no no first i think the full first year was was good no stone shower yeah first <laughs> first year was good So that was your first gig. We talk about the worst gig or the worst gigs the Monarch Resurrection has faced. We talk about the first gig. What was the greatest and the best gig you did, and how how was the crowd and where it was? I think this is a tough one because there are there have been a couple of them that would uh, sort of try for that spot. 
I think one of the first ones I would say would be the 2010 show at Inferno Festival in Norway. Uh, it was our first international gig. It was at a festival that we used to dream of playing at. It was in Norway. It was in the black metal capital of the world. I mean, it was like a dream come true. Uh, the performance was okay. We made a few mistakes here and there, but I don't think anyone noticed. But we had fans asking for one more song after the show. And there were some people who knew the lyrics. So just that that show has a really special place for us. Um, I definitely think one of our recent shows at Bloodstock Festival 2018 was another like in the top three for sure. Uh, so we, we played in the Sophie Lancaster tent. It's about 5,000 people can fit in there. And we fit 5,000 people in there. People actually came to see us and we had a huge circle pit and it was just one of the most fun gigs uh, ever. Again, performance-wise, there were a few slip-ups and all, but just the crowd vibe was like out of this world, man. Yeah, it's just such, you know, it's such, such uh, like inspirational to listen to all of this, you know, like, um, you, like you have toured the international uh, as a band. Uh, if you have to actually give a tip to a musician who is starting or maybe thinking of touring to make a living out of that, what would you say to that then? I'd say don't do it. So what's the explanation? <laughs> like, <laughs> so the thing is, if you want to play metal music, there is no money in it. And even if you want to tour, you are going to need a lot of money to make it happen. So it's better to get a day job that pays you a lot of money or at least whatever your qualifications will allow you and then enjoy playing music on the side. Um, so far, there is not a single, uh, maybe there is one, but apart from Bloody Wood, who I'm sure most people may have heard of, yes. uh, there, there is not a single other band or metal musician that is making a living playing metal music. Not a single one. Everyone has some kind of day job, whether that's in music or away from music. That, you know, may vary from person to person, but they are definitely not making a living playing metal music in their band. And even the Bloody Wood guys, I think it's only not, like recently that they are, because the band has really taken off. And the fact that they are, a, I, would, I would also call them a YouTube sort of, content creator in a way because that's where they started and yes that has given them the foothold to potentially be the biggest metal band from India ever and maybe the first one to ever make a living doing that and like especially the, the, the songs they have you know they just blend this Indian deep core culture with metal it just sounds fabulous like probably I have yeah. discovered Bloodywood a year back like a year back, so I was like unconscious of all of that shit that was happening. And the first time I heard their music was there was there's a song called uh, uh, Machi Bhasar. There's a song like that. And the first time I heard it, I'm like, oh fuck, man! I mean, the drills and then the drop C riffs over there. I'm like, holy shit! This is this is some good things. And uh, uh, like like probably yeah, like like uh, like apart from metal. What are the kind of a pros and cons of doing a band in general, especially in a country like India? Again, this is, this is too vast, so to speak, because band can be anything. I mean, are we talking rock band, singer-songwriter kind of band? Are you talking about regional band? Because look, in, in Kolkata, there have been bands making a living playing music for so long, actually. Fossils, and I mean, there's a whole Bangla rock scene that is is... Like, they don't go outside <laughs> Bengal. Like, nobody hears, like, well, you know. And then there are bands like, you know, Thaikudam Bridge and stuff who make. Then there's Pratik Kuhar, who's like a global sensation now. So, the, the, I mean, you have to reach a certain level to be able to make money. And again, most of these people also at some point were doing their music and doing other music-related things on the side. So, I think it's important if you want to pursue music, again, not talking about metal, if you want to pursue some other music, 
always have some kind of backup either in the music field itself either as a teacher uh, maybe a programmer or an arranger maybe a composer for jingles or scores and and have have that backup as well because you will need it you know exactly like you will like that's for sure that every musician will hit a rock bottom for sure it's not even rock bottom it's that the there is no stability right like so if you're a new guitar player or mm-hmm. if you're a new band it's going to take you a while to earn money that can sustain your lifestyle you know what i'm saying like the house you live in today what does it cost to rent that what is your grocery bill cost what are all your appliances and electricity bill your mobile bill your net bill what do all these costs how much does it take you per month to actually live and then does your band generate that much profit that you can have that much as a member of that band you know if you live in a city like bombay your a uh, monthly expenses can be anywhere from like you know 50k a month to 5 lakhs also depending where you live and what your lifestyle is you know so now you need to pay that monthly amount so how are you going to do it you know if your band is playing 2 gigs a month and even if you're making say 50000 you take home maybe 20000 what about the rehearsal cost travel cost to your rehearsal like so you have to have something that's filling up all the time right even the bands that are like playing 10 shows a month there are still 20 days left what are you doing in those 20 days you know so you will have to figure that out like what all can i do to pay the bills like unless you are like a superstar and you become like a bollywood playback singer and you are like the top of the you know game or something but even those guys are doing anything and everything they can you know whether it is public appearances and charging a fee for that whether it's uh, you know sponsored instagram posts whatever they're all working beyond just being that musician and i think that everyone has to realize today is that you can't just be a musician doing one thing it's very difficult exactly like this is the problem like this is one of the like you say one of my heartfelt things uh, when we say to people like when people ask you no know, we have in india especially we have this common uh, question aur bete kya karte ho yeah the answer to that from my end would be yes i'm a musician but it's really hard to explain that it's not just we just sit at home and play guitar and money falls from like somewhere else probably we have to teach maybe in this age digital age we have to create content maybe we are probably doing a startup in music for example maybe we are session guitar players maybe we are uh, giving our music to films and web series and yeah. productions and stuff so it's a combination of lot of probably 10 different things we have to do at the same time every day 24/7 to survive at the very basic level not even living i'm just talking about the survival like like we have to have the rice and dal at the very end of the day that's like the truth very truth yeah absolutely like you know the thing you say like most people don't say this like i have had conversations with people like not uh demonic resurrections front man but i had a uh, conversation with people probably this topic is never touched upon and probably i don't feel like asking this you know but because like there's someone there's a connection felt at somewhere who you can actually ask things what experience and all of that so this is the question i'm asking that is as musicians we do 10 different things and it takes a fucking huge amount of work a huge amount of work to ever put on uh, i recently saw one of your videos from the past 7 months that you have put out that i have hit a rock bottom uh apart from going that into like very deep into that what did exactly happen to you and why did you post that video well you post the video because now your whole life is on social media so you you kind of like it just becomes a thing it's like your second nature is like you just you want to let your followers know what's happening like kya ho raha hai like is this part of it um i think for me it's just the the kind of struggle with the youtube channel like um, you know being being sort of tied to um a job that kind of is based on metrics and views and things like that it's it is a daily sort of struggle to look at sometimes uh, you know like 
because it's like okay when you're in a job you're like okay i go i work 9 to 5 i get a salary salary stays fixed i get increments here it's like today i open my youtube oh shit 10000 views less money has dropped by 200 dollars hmm what did i do wrong next day you upload new video youtube this video is not performing as good as your other videos try thinking about why other videos worked and this one didn't okay fine theek hai next one you do something this video is number 1 yay awesome okay great next video this video is number 10 so it is a roller coaster like in it's an emotional roller coaster just having a daily look at that and just seeing like aaj aaj paisa upar gaya aaj niche gaya aaj now it's going down oh shit last year it was way more than this now it's gone down you know um, so that is one thing then you know and as a creator it's like i am making again i hate calling myself that for me it's art like if i put out a song i have this feeling that i want all my fans to hear it it's like you like my page you followed me on instagram this is what you came for here listen to it you know so on youtube it also feels the same it's like i made this recipe you came up for recipes why are you not watching the recipes you know and i have a channel with 675000 subscribers my last video was uploaded in march this year it got less than 20000 views so as i was saying uh, you know it's it's kind of like an emotional roller coaster like i said i have a channel with like 6000 675000 subs last video got less than 20000 views and that's kind of been the pattern over the last uh, year or so and i think eventually that just kind of got to me and it's like why am i doing this you know and again it's it's a lot of like I mean obviously I I have to then sit down and think okay cool why is this not working what is happening what can I do to fix it I tried a whole bunch of things and and basically that culmination was in like like it's like hard to even pick up the camera and film you know sometimes you just lose it like you know nahi ho raha hai I just it's not just happening what I want um, yeah and and again it's like it's it's again it's also an expectation you build up right you're like and the thing is these platforms are also like you know people subscribe but they may have just liked one video then they won't watch so and again when you're in a channel like i am which is like i said it's turned to keto diet now so keto diet is something that it's they're not necessarily watching the channel because they like me i mean maybe they like me but they're like it's not key like okay we are watching it no matter what sahil puts out we want to see it it's like i'm doing keto so i'm coming here for information i'm coming here for recipes now i'm not doing keto i don't need to watch or you know i'm a vegetarian i don't need to see his chicken recipes or you know i got what i needed from the channel about now it's over so for me that was a little hard to kind of accept because for me it's like this is my art like if you're for like you know if you listen to if you're following me on instagram for my music If I put out a new song, you're there to listen to it because you didn't come because you were trying to find some information about a song. You came because you actually liked the songs. Mm. So I think a lot of these factors, you know, again, every YouTuber is different, so you have to kind of learn and sort of accept these parts of being uh, a content creator. And you know, YouTube is is all about content creation and not so much about art. you know it is more about serving the audience what they want to see rather than the audience getting served what they have chosen to follow exactly you know what i'm saying like like when i follow metallica i am like there for metallica and i imagine if metallica had to make music thinking ki public ko kya sunna hai what does the audience want because youtube is serving you stuff based on what you watch but art needs to be created from an artistic view not uh, from the point of view ki what is the audience looking for and for me that is the biggest issue with being a content creator or a you know a content person because you are working for the algorithm and that's not art and i consider myself an artist so i make what i want and hopefully my art is served to the people through these platforms that is the hope and so i think that also is kind of then when you when you do that you have to kind of realize that okay if i'm going to do that i can't expect to get 
you know, like 600, 75,000 subscribers may say even 100,000 to watch. There's a good chance if I'm not making what people are searching for, they won't see it. And that's, I think, so all, all this stuff culminates and you're like, sometimes you just get fried and then you're like, here's what I'm going through. So you understand where I'm coming from also. And, you know, you go along with it. Like, like right now you have got a team behind yourself, like which is helping you create uh, the entire content for Headbangers Kitchen. Uh, I am the team. Look, guys, like, like how, how much can you learn from this man? Like, come on now. Like, you shoot the videos, you edit the videos, you distribute it to the platform, you market it, you provide the right keywords. Tell us something to that process which goes from brainstorming a video idea to actually putting it out on YouTube and seeing results. Okay. So I must first preface that by saying uh, over the last one year or so, I've got an editor. So for the last, I think 2021 say I've had an editor who's editing the videos. Uh, over the years, my wife Dipti has helped me a lot with writing the blog posts on the website because I also have to manage the website. Uh, I also do all the food photography uh, and the photo editing. I did try and get a photo editor for some time, but then again, I got back to doing it myself. There were also times where I hired a social media manager, uh, this girl Pratika, who plays, who's a who's a rapper who has a couple of rap projects. Uh, wow. She was doing my social media for a couple of months over the last two years or so. But before that, I handled everything uh, pretty much myself. Um, so for me, I I think when I started it, I just pretty much went with the flow. It's like I'm eating pizza made out of cauliflower recipe. But now, okay, let's what's good on the and I'm someone who keeps making new dishes anyway. So I literally make it. Okay, let's make it on Headbangers Kitchen. You know, I am planning to try this diet now. Let's film it. You know, so. And of course, as I went along, I was like, okay, chalo, let's think of some themes, ideas. So, you know, I had a whole curry week, dessert week, chocolate week, like did all these things. Um, but yeah, I just, when I have an idea, I put it down on some kind of paper somewhere. And then when I'm sort of like, okay, chalo, I need to film something today. Let's go through the ideas. What's in the house? What do I need to order? How much time does this take? So you do all that and it just, I don't know, it's just a process, man. It just happens. And of course, uh, free time is all spent on YouTube, watching videos. I must have watched like a thousand videos of how to grow your channel and how to do this and that and slowly take advice. And, you know, you learn to dot the I's and cross the T's because at the end of the day, the content is, if it's going to get popular, if it's going to be found and all, it's the content that matters. All the keyword and all is just, it's just making it neat and nice and packaging it. Like you can have all the keywords and all correct, but if your content is crap, it's not going to get views. Exactly. Exactly. Like, you know, uh, this, this, like, 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 you know, there's so many similarities I'm finding. Uh, like the first five times I shut down my channel, I actually browsed a billion videos searching how to get 10,000 views in 24 hours, how to get more likes, how to get more comments, how to get more subscribers, how to how to grow your channel, how to uh, make your first 100 subscribers. Like, you know, these are actually, I've become the number one trending keywords in Google and YouTube for the past 10 I've, years. I've like. watched all, all these videos. I've watched all these from all different creators. And there is, honestly, there is just one thing that you need, uh, two things actually, I would say, is that you need to really love making videos. Exactly. You have to, you have to love it and you have to love it like that if no one gives you one paisa or if not even one person watches it, you will still make it. If you do that, if you have that in you, it's like, for, it's like music. I will write songs whether one person listens or one million people listen. It doesn't tomorrow matter. If, if, yeah, tomorrow if, if my access to the internet is removed and I'm banned from the internet for life, you know, I'll still write songs because I like doing that. I like recording. I like producing it. I like hearing my track come to life and I'll do it with or without financial incentive. And I can do it till the day I'm dead. That's the first thing you need. If you have that, then it's just a matter of like 
putting it out there on youtube and just doing that you know and if and if you want to really be a youtuber you have to make something that people are looking for but at the same time it has to be authentic to you and you have to it has to be something you can do over and over again you know because at the end of the day look if you are if you are just going to open up a channel and start talking about yourself for example what are the chances anyone is going to be interested probably very few but tomorrow you are providing something to people that they are looking for for example you start a podcast about musicians talking about their struggles or may musicians and mental health a lot of musicians on youtube it has offering them something in terms of comfort something to be to help them through tough days they knowing that other musicians go through the same problem understanding what may come their way in the future and how they'll deal with it so then you are creating things that people are looking for so for me it was i was making cooking videos that i enjoyed making i was making videos without knowing it for a diet that people were searching for and that's why it clicked so it just connected somewhere from the audience perspective yeah. as well oh. yeah it was a, it was a complete accident a very happy accident but you know like if tomorrow i was genuinely like if my only dream in life was to be a youtuber and it was to be a cooking youtuber then i would literally find that line between my artistic vision and what people are going to get something out of you know that is what i would find and if that is good then if the production is bad it see production and all will get better you know like your quant your quality will go up with more practice you learn things you know and again if you are interested you will work to it you will work towards exactly you know? yeah there has to be an interest to improve on what you are doing like tomorrow if you are writing a song on on guitar even if you don't sit and practice like we said all your scales or whatever but tomorrow you are writing a song and you have a musical idea that you can't exactly nail you will practice it till you can nail it so you will improve and the same with youtube so you will be like okay i did this podcast now it's good but you know if i had got the guest to record his audio on his daw and if i had got two small lights it would look better you know you will be like okay cool how do i do this now with what i have at home so you look up some videos diy lighting kits etc etc so you'll make the effort because you know what you want to improve you have a vision that you're striving for you know you might look at the joe rogan podcast and be like i want to have that flow in my podcast you know and you'll be like okay let's see what joe is doing okay joe has resources this is how he makes it less interview and more conversational exactly so it's if then if you have that then all this thing of keywords and description and title and all and of course everyone will tell you youtube made title and thumbnail will be the ah. third most important thing most important is what the hell are you putting inside your videos is it interesting for you to do so because if you don't have any interest or any passion for doing that why will people watch that there's no reason yeah right Yeah. So that's the that's probably the reason which sums up uh, my entire five ten failure on YouTube. Still, I'm a failure, but a blissful failure. Um, See, you're not. Ian, it's not a failure. Even if you've tried it, you've learned something. Even if you've learned mm -hmm. that you don't want to do it, even if you learned all the mistakes in one and closed the other, you learned. It's a journey. There's not. There's nothing like failure. You've not failed. It's that's just a se stepping stone in your journey to getting somewhere. You know. Exactly. Exactly. And like for the example you gave, like Joe Rogan, for example, he has put out probably like five thousand videos on his channel. For and he's doing it for probably like ten, fifteen years. We don't know. And the way and he has yes, and yeah, can you? Know, so I was just I was just going to say like like you see Joe Rogan. A good example is people know him now. Now he's a household name. But everyone's like, what about the twenty, thirty years before this that he was doing exactly. comedy clubs? you know he was like a time pass host in fear factor and then finally he reached a point where this podcast thing just took off for him you know so you know like there's a journey for everyone and i mean he could have said i'm a failed comedian i'm a failed presenter on tv or whatever like but he's not those were all his stepping stones to 
his journey and to the point where he's reached now and maybe 15 20 years from now this will have been a stepping stone to what he's doing later you know exactly like that will become a probably an entity which will be like displayed in the museum for example like this was a guy yeah. or this was a man who did something like this which will serve the future uh, problems and needs people will have 20 or 30 years from now yeah uh, it's not even future problems it's just entertainment like his is maybe some of his uh, sketches from back in the day like even now those fear factor clips are all like vintage entertainment his podcast has got interviews with people that are going to be timeless you know like you can go back and listen to like you know maybe 50 60 years from now when james hetfield is dead and gone you can go back and listen to his interview on joe rogan you know like that's, so that's the just the nostalgia that will hit actually yeah that's the point is that the, it's 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 there like those are stories you know they i mean the possibilities of what they can do with it are endless Yeah. like you know that's why at the very first i said probably to every band and musician i said this because what i have in this uh, podcast which i do is there is no script like i have no pen i have no paper i just don't do anything i just uh you know i just chat in in my people they come over and then we just start talking and it just grows somewhere i don't know and i don't need the feel to by you know structure it and because it becomes too mechanical like you know there's no just such flow Then we are talking about a problem, and then the next question would be, okay, what well, what is your net worth? No, oh, no, no, that that's not a question. Maybe the good question would be, how do we get there? For example, right? Like, so, uh, probably a last few uh, questions for you, musicians who are starting out right now, or bands who are starting out, or creative people in creative fields who are starting out, especially in music. what advice do you have for them for making this as a career uh <laughs> yeah so like i said keep your day job i i think um i mean just work man like find anything and do it you know like if you're in a band okay it's one thing to focus on the band and all that but have something else that you are making money from to pay your bills you know uh like especially band situations are tricky because you got to first make sure that all the band members are on the same page exactly you know? there there's a reason i am the only surviving member from the first iteration of demonic resurrection today because i was the only one who has had that vision that this is what my end goal is and if if in a band that's not everyone's end goal then that's never going to last you know so i think that is the first thing to have but again you know like when you're starting out you're not you're not most of the bands are starting because they want to have fun they want to do this this is a this is like i i think that's a that's a nicer way to start a band rather than ki okay i learned guitar i want to play music for a career i want to form a band and that's going to be my career i feel that that kind of changes the way the art is created as well because you're then writing with the purpose of earning you know like if you have like thought it out that much again there is no right or wrong here but i just feel that if you're first doing it just simply because you love it you're more likely to get to your destination provided you plan and there is no like there's no hard and fast rules there is no blueprint that i can tell you that this is how it will go all i can tell you is work hard write and music that is work that is right music that is true to you and uh, in fact more than all this i would tell musicians the moment you start making any money doing anything in life start saving 30% of it exactly most important start saving money once you got a decent amount of savings try to start investing them in things so that your money starts making more money for you money making you know, money yeah money making money that is actually more important so that there is less stress on you as time goes by you know if you're living paycheck to paycheck your life is going to be a lot harder so you know do some do less drugs do uh, drink less alcohol uh, don't smoke cigarettes you'll save a lot of money just not doing these three things exactly put that money somewhere and for and please for fuck sake get health insurance 
for yourself and your family because trust me like i think those are the two most important things make sure you're saving money and get health insurance all the other stuff in your career will find its way you'll 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 teach guitar if you need to you'll do uh you know jingles or bollywood music or sessions music if you need to make ends meet you know you you'll do that we know that musicians will do whatever is required if that's what they want to do or they'll get a job and do music on the side whatever it is because there's no shortcut a lot of it is just luck timing uh, your skill level you know your natural talent versus what skill level you cultivate and not everyone is going to make it big some people are going to be just mid range some people are just going to be teachers some people are going to be uh, playing in wedding band some people are going to be ganpati dhol you know whatever it is and neither one is better or worse than the other whatever your goal is you will work towards it and you will do everything to make it happen uh, providing this circumstance that the goal is actually important for you only then you yeah. strive for the betterment otherwise it's just yeah. ah wo hai le, le, we'll do it probably we we'll like and that, procrastinate yeah. and that can be your goal if you wanted to be but you know i mean <laughs> come on now it's music don't make fun of it <laughs> No, no. I mean, like, if somebody wants to just procrastinate, play music once a week, twice a week, good for them. Like, no, not everyone has to, you know, have like a like a path chalked out. But I mean, you will have to do something to make money. That's a different story. But you can have that relationship with music too. That's you know, it's your call. So, uh, people as musicians or as creative uh, entrepreneurs, as I like to call them. Uh, How much role does learning certain aspects of business? Like it doesn't matter if you're creative, it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, if it doesn't matter if you're a dentist. What aspects of learning certain parts of business? For example, uh, what's the ROI of my uh, YouTube campaign? For example, how much is my uh, ads performing? For example, how much is my metrics doing? How much is this important for creative people to understand? this aspect of thing because it's not a lot of not a lot of life is kind of reflected on that i see youtubers doing podcast but i haven't seen a lot of life reflected on this so if you have reached a point where you're like okay this creative venture of mine is it's my this is what i want to do this is going to be my business you have to treat it like a business so in that case you have to learn every aspect of business and you obviously look it's it's impossible for everyone to know everything about everything but you have to know the basics of everything so that at some point you can hire people who know it better you know and then you can understand what they're telling you so for example you're a band you're like okay cool we have we have got a 5 10 year plan for the band this is what we're going to do we're going to put out so many albums we're going to try and play these many shows whatever now we need some advertising campaign we don't have money right now we're just starting so you need to learn how to do that you need to understand the basics enough that you can start doing that maybe in 3 years you have finally you know got some payoff from all the ads the touring the music and now you are finally making some revenue and that revenue can be put into hiring someone to run ads which in turn will bring you more revenue so you're like okay now i'm hiring this person and when this person tells you stuff Like okay, so we're targeting these countries. We're using these. You understand what he or she is saying. So you treat it like a business, and you obviously you either outsource it to people, you know. So you're like, okay, we're a band. We're just starting out. We don't know anything about marketing our music, but let's let's all collect money. We got thousand dollars. We're going to invest it and we hire someone to do the job, you know. So you treat it like a business, and in that case, you learn. all the aspects of business the chances of getting the results you want probably becomes a bit more or a 90% more than 90% yeah like it's it's the same thing as like a, like if you're a singer i mean if you're a musician now if i have just started uh, sort of my journey um and i've written my first song and i want to record it now the result if i were to record it at home on my own using my sound card which i did 22 years 24 years ago versus what the result would have been had i saved up some money and gone to a producer two drastically different things and the, the outcome of that would also be different so perhaps 
you know you your simple uh sort of decision to go to a producer suddenly a producer is giving you perspectives you would have never had otherwise you would have never got from a youtube tutorial he's teaching you things at a rate that you would have had to go through five different youtube videos been confused about and then taken a random decision and probably not got the result you know a simple thing like maybe a producer helped you rearrange your song maybe he taught you that a chorus could be catchier if you change two notes and harmonize something which all if you were at home you would never get those lessons so there are pros and cons to everything but maybe you just don't have the money you're not in a well to do family your parents have cut you off because you dropped out of college so you can't afford the producer whatever the reason is so you have to you all going to have your own journey but understand that there are pros and cons to every decision and you should think of that from a business perspective also you know maybe you're like okay if i can take a loan and the or this producer is willing to give me 6 months emi payment i can afford his services and in turn the improvement in the entire song resulted in you getting 3 4 shows where you got paid 4 5000 rupees and you could pay the guy so you know you look at it from different perspectives so it's like what works for you is works for you. just keep hustling and seeing what are the different ways you can uh, try to do things in a business perspective because at the end of the day i hear this a lot i hear a lot like especially from musicians uh, from my circle uh, is that money uh, doesn't matter it's the art that uh, that matters what's your thought on this like really money doesn't matter or it's the most essential thing for survival i think i mean without money they would not even have the instruments so i don't know how people say things like that i think i think what they mean is they are not making art with the intent of making money exactly mm-hmm. but at the end of the day if you want to make like if you want to just live your life making art you need money Absolutely. and i think again you know this is a little bit of that old school mentality ki are you are making money you sell out like you must have heard it obviously you know Ah. because a sell out so all you can do is ignore those people that's it like why should you why should you waste any of your energy with people who have that thought and so if they want to make music for art not sell their music not play shows and charge money good for them they can do that you know you have a different goal and a different idea you know for me i sell my music and i hammer it in for like the last 22 years not because i'm going to make a lot of money from it but because i want people to value my music for me it's not because i'm going to i like i if i can break even on an album cost i will be super happy you know like i can't like the lifestyle i have i cannot pay for it unless i'm like making a lot more money but i still want everyone to pay for my music not because i want that 5 dollars or whatever but because i want my music to have value And again, there are artists who want to give music for free. There are artists who say we don't care about money, but they'll still charge a ticket for their show. They still sell their music. So I mean, it's just ignore other people. I think I think we spend too much time thinking about what about these people who are saying this. Let them ah, say it. exactly, exactly, exactly. Like you know, there are always certain ten uh, percent group of people who are always like this shouldn't be done, probably because they haven't done it themselves, or maybe have failed doing so. That may be yeah. reason, and maybe they they have a different view of of uh, you know what certain things should be like. That's just people. There's like you know people will be like uh, I don't know so many different things. Don't put kishmish in butter chicken. <laughs> maybe there's some guy who wants to put kishmish in butter chicken. Let him do it. Yeah. Who do you? Who are you to stop him? <laughs> so kishmish is kishmish. We can't argue with kishmish. Yeah. So it's like nothing is wrong. Like do whatever the hell you want. Just just don't uh, interfere in what people are doing. <laughs> That's the more healthy yeah, approach. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you're not bothering other people, as long as you're not being a bad person, it's cool. Exactly. Um. So that's kind of a lot to say from your side. Uh, really, a lot of words to say. How I feel. Like doing this podcast with you. Uh, a really last question. That is, I don't know how much you have. Like you don't really have the time to browse anything that I've like done. But any tip you have for me as a musician as well? Um, 
honestly man just keep doing what you're doing i think um if you enjoy what you're doing just like just go with it man like i think that automatically will you know again like i said everything is about intent right like what is your intent with your music what is your end goal you know like if you want me to actually sit down and break down ki you could do this 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 i i need to know what your end goal is but i think at the the the, the grand scheme of things is man just enjoy what you're doing and keep doing it you know I mean, you know, that's been a really a uh, poster ride for you. Probably we have joined three times because you know, Zoom doesn't allow us <laughs> more than forty minutes, and we have been mad at him for three times. So, uh, guys who are watching this, really sorry for annoying Mr. Uh, Sahil, Mr. Demon Stealer, as you all know. All all good man, and you can just call me Sahil or Demon Stealer. No Mr. and all required. <laughs> No, no, it's just that it, it comes from the bottom of my heart. You know, like I've seen I know, I know. what you have done. You know, it's just you know, like there's no word else rather than sir that can come out. Like, come on now, like you're kidding. Um, so for the audience who is watching, uh, you already don't need an introduction, but I'll still leave all of the links I can of everything this man has done for over like dedicated and. Well, he gave twenty-five years of his life creating stuff in the description. Please do check it out. Like, there's nothing more worse. You can sum it up. And uh, please, if you can, uh, do subscribe my channel. Or maybe if you don't like, you don't want to subscribe. It's fine. Like, do whatever the hell you want. But uh, see, see, he is putting thumbs up. I'm so. subscribe and hit the like button, guys. Like, see, see, go on. Thousand now. subscribers at least. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sahil, sir, for doing this. It's been a Such a lovely experience from my side. Uh, I've never thought I would do this too. Uh, very well wishes for the future endeavors. I uh, probably will meet soon. Maybe doing some music someday. Sure. Thank you for having me, and uh, I really do appreciate it, man. Thank you so much, and good night. Have a lovely day in front of you. Thank you so much. Right. Stay metal. Cheers. Yes. Yes. Stay metal. Cheers.